Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate that. I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's on the call for joining and taking time out of what is clearly a busy and hectic time for everybody. And um, we appreciate you getting on the call. We're uh, thrilled with the response. We had um, close to, if not more than 100 people request to be on the call. And um, and I just wanted to thank you for participating. I think this is really encouraging. We looked at your questions, a number of the questions that were sent in and tried to adjust the agenda to answer as many questions as possible. But I do want to tell you that uh, I'm sure there are a number of people who had questions that didn't get sent in. So my goal is to go through the agenda um, pretty quickly so that what we can spend most of the meeting doing is answering any questions that you have that you may send in through chat. They'll be monitored and open up the, the room, uh, so to speak, for people to be able to ask questions as uh, a majority of the time that we spend together today. Um, so that's what we wanna do so that, that we really take this opportunity to hear from people in the community so that we make sure that this is your time and not, my, not just my time to be talking. I did want to start, though, by um, introducing the team, the state team. So um, today we have with us uh, Heather Mincy, who's the Assistant Director for Developmental Disabilities, um, Brenda Duhamel, who, um, yep, who works on our team, functioning a lot of our projects, overseeing uh, and seeing through a lot of the projects on the team. Unfortunately, Tracy Cunningham is not able to join us, but Jay McKay is here in her place. Um, Anne LeClaire is here and uh, Susan Hayward. So, um, and Susan works on our transitions and Anne uh, works in a number of areas um, related to some consent decree work and does a lot of our work in terms of communication and on the Therap project, which is our database. So um, we'll get started. So I wanted to start with our updates and uh, of course, COVID is, is a lot of the work that uh, we're focusing on now and making sure that we're working as much as possible uh, with our, our uh, agency providers and people in the community. But I wanted to give you some statistics so it's no secret you're hearing on the news um, what the COVID impact is, particularly as things have been heating up in the last several weeks. Um, right now, um, of the 291 sites that we have that are providing um, residential services, 31 are currently impacted. And um, of the, uh, in the last 14 days, 63 staff members and 33 residents have been impacted by um, COVID. So it, it, they're currently showing no hospitalizations, but um, I believe that that's just because the, the data at the Department of Health is tracking a few days behind what's being reported. Um, so if anyone has questions on that, just hold your questions and we can certainly get to uh, more specific data if people have more data questions. But I thought that's probably what you wanna know for what's going on, what's happening right now. So I'll leave the data to that. Another uh, update we got out last Friday was on updating uh, visitation guidance. So there had been some uh, relaxation and visitation standards uh, for residential care, but we sent out on Friday um, uh, a pullback on visitation and 
very, very strongly advising um, the, the congregate care providers across our system uh, to um, suspend all visitation other than for uh, very specific compassionate care visits. And, um, and, I, and I know that's, this is really a hard time as the holidays are coming up. Um, but because of the outbreak, the number of staff and residents who are being impacted, we thought that that was the best course of action to take. Um, so we began implementing that right away. And, and we needed to uh, move in that very, very quickly to keep um, this vulnerable population as safe as possible as um, things are heating up with the spread of COVID uh, currently. And again, if you have questions, we can certainly talk about that as we get through the agenda. Um, some other uh, updates that I'll give you is, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the concerns about what the impact is for long-term uh, quarantining and social distancing for people in, particularly in residential facilities, but also on people who are self-directing or otherwise living at home, that this can be a really lonely time. So I would encourage you um, to work with your loved ones or yourselves if you are are a person with a disability and you're on the call to read bulletins that we put out regarding uh, positive mental health activities that you can engage in. Um, some providers are doing virtual activities, so I would encourage you to participate in those um, so that you do get some kind of access to uh, community supports. If you feel that you're not getting the kind of support that you need and you need to engage in another referral or work with another agency, please feel free to call your social caseworker and um, seek out uh, information on another kind of referral or referral to an agency who can provide group activities uh, online. Um, we're working with Medicaid to talk, to verify that group activities can be billed to Medicaid. So there's been some lack of clarity and we're working to resolve that. Um, but please feel free to ask any questions you, you need to on how you can get the services or your family members can get services that you need um, to be supported um, as we get through these uh, winter months, which uh, we're anticipating will be very difficult ones. Um, we're working on, we're working on um, CIS, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, we have, we're, we've gotten the CIS uh, workers recertified, so that's been completed and we're getting the CIS um, meeting scheduled on a secure Zoom line, a HIPAA compliant Zoom line. There are 241 CIS meetings that need to be scheduled and the scheduling is underway. And so we'll be getting that done. Um, I know that plan writing is also happening on Zoom lines, so I would just encourage people to remember that as you're accessing um, Zoom lines, just to be mindful of uh, privacy conversations and to, um, to really do your best to make sure that if, you're, if you can to use um, compliant HIPAA lines so that, that your calls aren't being, uh, that you're not using or, or, or engaging in HIPAA related calls that aren't, that on, on lines, excuse me, on lines that aren't secure. So try to be very, very careful about that. There was a question about uh, keeping day programs afloat and preventing them from shutting down. And so we don't certainly want to lose any services during this pandemic. We know that services are extremely important to all uh, people with disabilities and certainly to their families to make sure that they have access. We're strongly focusing on community-based program, and that will be our focus not only now uh, during uh, this pandemic, but also going forward that we want to see that um, people have access to services where they need them and um, in ways that are much more individualized than they've been in the past. So we're gonna continue to focus on community-based support and community-based programming to meet consumer needs going forward. Um, the pandemic has changed many um, individuals, many ways that individuals might be use, utilizing their allocation for day fund supports. So if you have unused day fund supports and are interested in using them differently, 
such as to purchase technology or equipment, or hiring staff or changing services or joining a gym class, please reach out to your provider agency, fiscal intermediary, or your social case worker um, for support in, in how to go about um, using your funds in ways that you haven't been before. There are flyers available that you can read that will help you um, figure out how to access those resources. Um, recently, the department approved um, supporting SLA providers to receive day support funding for providing services, day support services to individuals living in their homes. And so we're working on operationalizing that support. So in the same way that um, we've worked with family members, which is a new policy uh, during the pandemic to access day support funding for um, their adult uh, child with a developmental disability, we're doing the same thing uh, to, to help um, support SLA members who in the past would have access to day programming outside the home since they're providing the support inside the home. We're working to actually fund that support as well. We have a new initiative called START, capital all caps S-T-A-R-T, which is an evidence-based model that includes intensive training and certification of individuals as quote unquote start coordinators. And the Center for Start Services will work with Rhode Island to develop a crisis intervention system uh, for individuals with uh, intellectual developmental disabilities that also have behavioral health needs. And the start coordinators provide crisis prevention and intervention services. Leadership uh, in the department and around the state are very excited and on board uh, funding is secured and a contract with the Center for Start Services is in the works so that we'll be getting that up and running. And uh, we're excited because it works to train people um, in the behavioral health and mental health communities to specifically work to meet the needs of people with IDD. So that's uh, very exciting. Um, we wanna talk about EVV electronic employment verification and I'm going to ask Heather, she's our resident expert on EVV. So She's going to give a brief update. Oh, so EVV. EVV is the electronic visit verification system that individuals who self-direct their services and um, need full assistance for some of the services that they're getting would have to um, would have to do basically. So where we're at with this right now is EVV is set to um, be implemented with the January 1st of 2021 start date. It's kind of a soft launch because we're still working with, um, you know, the, the FIs and all the stakeholders to get people on board and people up to speed as to, um, you know, what needs to be done. So there are groups that are going on that are meeting to discuss some of these things. We just recently were working towards trying to figure out within our system of those, you know, who are using the self-directed model, how many people would be subject to, to EVV. And we have um, out of the five FIs, four have responded so far. And we do know that there's through these four FIs, 37 individuals that will be subject to EVV. So it's not um, a lot of people within our system. But for those people who will be affected, we definitely want to make sure that they understand what it is and what they're doing and, and how to use this system. So there's, again, just work that's being done uh, behind the scenes on that. We're also going to be putting out very soon a um, just uh, one pager on information regarding what EVV is and you know who would be subject to it. And that's pretty much it, Kevin. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Heather. And Jay McKay is going to give an update on PSEP 3. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just to give an update on what Tracy and I have been up to, uh, PSEP 3 is well underway, uh, which is the Person Centered Supported Employment Performance Program. Um, we've got four projects that are working with us Looking Upwards, Perspectives, Seven Hills, and Work Inc. Um, PSEP 3 was designed around consent decree individuals who are part of the protected class. So that will be youth exit, shelter workshop and day um, and individuals who have never been employed. Um, so if people are interested in finding out more about this program, there is a flyer on the DD uh, employment website section. 
Um, there is also, as part of that flyer, there are some links. Uh, there's PowerPoint presentations from all four projects that you can look into. And there is also, thanks to Advocates in Action, um, we had done a virtual house of um, all the programs. Uh, so there is a recording link um, that you can also check out and get some more information. If you're not sure whether you're um, eligible for this program, you can contact myself or your social caseworker. Um, so we can let you know about that. And if PCEP3 is not something for you, then there are other employment programs that are still um, going on, even through COVID. Uh, we have many heroes that uh, continue to work as essential workers. We have some individuals that have been furloughed. Um, and we've had actually many job hires uh, since March as well, too. So um, a lot of good things going on in the employment. Um, another thing that had happened last month is we had Real Talk about employment, which was hosted by um, Ripen. Uh, we had a pair-to-pair -pair group, and we also had a family-to-family -family, uh, group. That was on October 22nd and 29th. Um, so they talked about their experiences and answered questions about those who are still hesitant about employment. Um, so we will probably be doing a couple more of those sessions. Uh, so stay tuned for more information. And that's all I have for employment. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Nice. Um, so I actually gave this this update. I don't have anything else to add on that. So I'm going to go to uh, the consent decree. So uh, under the consent decree, um, the court had issued an order identifying 16 administrative barriers that um, the department was, I'll say asked, but actually ordered to work on um, to relieve the burden that particularly providers um, need to use resources that distract them from providing the resources to um, people with uh, disabilities and, and instead um, use those resources to meet administrative requirements in a number of areas. And so um, what we did was we combined the, the 16 um, administrative issues into five work groups to try to address how we can relieve those administrative burdens so that resources can be freed up um, to provide um, uh, the services to people and the, the resources where they're needed to provide services to people with disabilities. And so the, the five work groups um, are dealing with um, the barriers that are related to fiscal concerns, eligibility, appeals. So when people want to appeal uh, funding or uh, a decision made by the department, contracts, and that by contracts, it's how um, a person um, sets up from their ISP to how they, they actually get their services uh, met by a provider. So. They're, they're basically their PO plus their ISP is what we call the contract. And then individual budgets, uh, how someone's individual budget is managed between them and either the provider or the, the FI. And so those work groups, they've been meeting uh, every week. There are some subgroups and work groups um, as well to try to get to the bottom of what we can do to relieve all the fiscal issues that um, families and providers and um, individuals are, are working on and our, uh, their work kind of gets bogged down on. And we have a responsibility to report to the court um, every two months, we do that. And we've had two reports that have gone out so far. We're sort of at a midway point. We're trying to get all of the uh, decisions and recommendations out by the end of the year. Um, later this week, we have a sort of midpoint meeting where all of the groups are going to get together and discuss where they're at, make sure that we're heading in the same direction because there's a lot of interaction that happens and overlap that happens among the groups where what decision one group makes is going to impact another group. So we wanna make sure that, that we're not working in a manner that's counterproductive, but we wanna be heading in the same direction. And um, the groups have uh, a good cross-section of representation among stakeholders. We have, um, people with disabilities on the group. We have family members in the group, advocates, obviously members of the state, different state um, agencies. So B BHDDH, o e EOHHS, Department of Human Services, all providing uh, the information so that the right expertise is there to be able to 
uh, get um, decisions made, questions answered, and keep the progress moving forward. So um, I, I'm not going to get into the details, although people have questions about the details. I'm certainly willing to do that. I have the last court report here in front of me. Um, but I, I think the, the main gist of what I want to get out to um, this, this population is that um, it's important that we recognize that the more we're bogging you down with administrative burdens, uh, the more we're distracting and detracting from um, people being able to provide services to the people who need them. And that's what we want to address. So that's really the main issue with the work groups. Um, I will, I, I, that's really all I had on where we are with the consent decree. Um, we're working hard. We have a great group of people working together. I, I think it's, it's significant amount of cooperation between the three agencies involved, ORS, RIDE, Rhode Island Department of Education, BHDDH. Uh, we work extremely well with uh, um, the court monitor and um, we've had excellent leadership. Brian Goslin has been leading the, the team um, and for the past, I, I would say year. And I'll just ask Brian if he has anything that he would like to add at this point. I, uh, good afternoon, nothing in addition to add, Kevin. I know that there's been a ton of work out there and new reports from the monitor that are really outlining the pathway for the next three years to the end of the consent decree 2024, which is what we are all aiming towards, uh, making sure that the system is in compliance with what the court has ordered, but also it is around, centered around the person, which has been the main intent of all of the work around integrated day employment services in particular. So I, I talk to many of you on a regular basis and appreciate all the support um, in my interim role as the consent decree coordinator since for actually almost two years at this point, believe it or not. And we're looking forward to uh, providing some additional resources to the consent decree as we move forward. So um, nothing to dish in addition to add, but always here for any questions or outreach that the community or providers have. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the next uh, issue is con conflict-free case management. A work group, a working subgroup of the Quality Advisory Committee, um, which meets monthly. The Quality Advisory Committee meets monthly, but the subgroup, I actually don't know how often it meets, has been charged with developing a recommendation for a conflict-free case management model. And uh, the group is uh, fleshing out details for each federally required component of case management to include a purpose, set of expected activities and tasks, and provider standards. A timeline of eight weeks has been established to complete the task. So I'm going to guess they meet every week, but Brenda Duhamel is here. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Brenda? Brenda leads the charge on this. So I wanted to um, just let her add anything she wants. Sure. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, so that's spot on. We're working in a small work group. We then will we'll present to the Quality Advisory Committee. And we're also working with a group from... <clears throat> Um, OHHS um, that works sort of looking at the system for all the folks on long-term services and supports and to see how conflict-free case management um, could work across the entire system. So we're um, in, a, in a couple of work groups to, to go through those things and to see what makes sense. We're hoping to have some product by the end of this year to present. Okay, thanks Brenda. There were some questions about technology. And um, so we, we had some funding from technology uh, and to help people to purchase technology um, from the previous um, fiscal year. And we moved that money forward to this fiscal year. Uh, oh, actually that, that's a different issue. So I'm gonna say that wrong. But there is, there is funding available, sorry, um, for helping people purchase technology. Um, and there's a request to itemize what can be, what services such as technology can be purchased. So we are working to get that kind of information out to people, but I did want to remind people that in a system where we're trying to make things and working to make things individualized, there's really no exhaustive list because we, we always want to be able to consider individualized and individual requests and work with Medicaid on how to fund those requests. Um, so, so, so I appreciate the question on can we get a list out, 
I think we can get a list out that refers to types of things we can buy and specific things we can um, purchase. But when an individual has a question, I want people to really think in a way that identifies, this is what I need. And can we talk about that? Rather than just going down a list and saying, uh, it's not on the list, therefore we can't do it. Let's keep the uh, conversations about the needs of people very, very open, um, rather than just referring to lists. So, so we'll get it out because I think that is important, but, but keep the conversation expansive. And we certainly are. Um, this this uh, pandemic has exposed, I think, very clearly the need um, to um, use technology and to make technology as available as possible um, to people out in the community and um, to keep particularly visitation so that people have a way of visiting people when uh, person to person visits can't happen. We also want to be sensitive to um, the fact that not everybody um, can use technology. So we want to make sure that we're addressing what to do uh, when people aren't able to use technology and not merely rely on technology. So we want to keep also that conversation very expansive so that we're meeting everybody's needs. Um, the last section I think that I had was on um, budget and funding. Uh, so I think I'm probably going to defer a lot of that conversation to the next uh, community forum um, because we don't have a lot of answers on the budget yet. So some of the questions are anticipated funding cuts. We don't know what, what's coming. So we don't have a budget that's um, that's been approved yet. So I'd rather wait until we have a specific and approved budget before we get into uh, speculative conversations about the budget. So if, if you have questions, I'll, I'll take specific questions and see what we can answer. But at this point, I think that I'm gonna delay the conversation on the budget until we have something more specific and concrete to, to work on. And then I'm gonna turn over the conversation to um, Sue to talk about um, progress on transition services. Sure, thanks, Kevin. Um, what happened was we had received a question about what progress has been made in improving the DD system from transition services and beyond. So what I'll be sharing with you is some things that are already in existence, but also some things that are, that are new um, since the last community forum. So one of the things that we've been doing for quite some uh, time is working very closely with the Department of Education, Office of Rehabilitative Services and Rhode Island Parent Information Network to create an annual collaborative state plan. And that state plan addresses transition planning and services and guides our shared work in multiple areas throughout the year. We also participate in local, regional, and state transition advisory council meetings. And those provide an opportunity for educators, state partners, family advocacy organizations, and adult service providers to share information. We also provide adult service information to students between the ages of 14 and 22 in all public, private, and charter schools throughout Rhode Island through our participation in IEP meetings for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The information that we share is also available on our recently updated transition services page. That page was actually updated this morning, I'm happy to say, on our uh, BHDDH website. So all our transition related uh, materials are translated into Spanish. We also have a Spanish phone line monitored through our contract with Rhode Island Parent Information Network. And that page also includes links to state and national organizations that provide information regarding transition. As many of you know, we have an eligibility by 17 policy. We've had that in place for several years now. And that has led to an increase in students eligible for adult services several years prior to exit from school funded services. So that has actually allowed for improved transition planning with the student, their caregiver and the IEP team. What we've been able to do is assign DDD social workers to eligible students at least one year, but most often two years prior to their exit from school funded services. All our social workers have undergone training specific to transition services, and they're also provided ongoing information and resources for that work. 
uh, also together with the Department of Education and ORS, we provide presentations uh, to over 60 schools annually to introduce adult service options to educators throughout Rhode Island. And that again is for um, educators in public, private and charter schools. We also, uh, in collaboration with ORS and Department of Education, participate in three project search sites, which provide school to work services for students in their last year of schooling. Um, we've also started, this is some of the newer uh, information that I have, we've recently started a transition community of practice with representatives from adult provider agencies with the goal of increasing communication with educators across the state. One of the initial steps has been to collaborate with the Department of Education to hold what we're calling provider chats, which are opportunities for adult service agency staff to communicate directly with educators through facilitated conversations. So through that group, we'll be doing a number of things, um, some of which include sharing resources and training opportunities. And we anticipate that that group will be meeting quarterly throughout the year. Uh, following really a great deal of input from families, educators, provider agencies, and social service staff, we've created a transition timeline for caregivers. And that timeline provides benchmarks for steps to be taken as students move through the transition process. We've included that timeline as part of the information packet that we share with students and families during the IEP meetings. And that timeline can also now be found on the transition page on our website. And we've also done outreach to children's organizations like the CEDAR organizations to reach a younger population and provide information regarding the process of transition and uh, transition services. Thanks, Sue. I appreciate that. Um, so that's all that we, I had for our agenda, and I know that there are a number of questions in the chat room, so I think Michelle's going to help. We have questions in the chat. We have a couple in the question and answers, um, and and there's a couple that looks like possibly from the notes the, the, that were sent in um, ahead of time. There might be a few that we didn't totally hit. So um, from the question and answers, the first one is, once a purchase order is created, approximately how long does it take for the SLA to receive the funding? Well, that's a good question. So, Heather, do you know the answer to that? I, I don't have a specific answer on it. We're working with the provider agencies right now. If, if the question is in regards to the, the enhanced SLA stipend, um, we're working on that right now. Hopefully it is going to happen soon. Um, but again, we're in the pro process of doing that, so I don't have an exact date. But it won't be much longer. That I, I can ensure people, it will not be much longer. Just explain the new funding program really quick, just in case that was a piece of information. That's just the enhanced. So it's the, it, yeah, it's an enhanced stipend. So as Kevin said before, for SLA providers who are now, you know, find themselves um, home from, from work and, um, you know, just working more with the individuals um, throughout the whole day versus, you know, somebody who might have been going out getting community-based day support somewhere else. We, we put in place, a, you know, this enhanced stipend because at this point in time, they are just, you know, doing, doing more with the individual within the SLA setting. Okay. Uh, the do we know how many SLAs have had the opportunity to be funded through this new funding program? So I don't have an exact, I, I just, I don't know off the top of my head. I was trying to look for that quickly because I saw that question come up. So I want to say it's, it's like over 120, but I don't have the exact number right now. Can you tell how will situations with SLA day enhancement be handled when day programs choose to close after we, after request has been sent in and then reopens for a short period of time and then closes again? Does a new request need to be submitted every change that occurs? So a, a new request, yes. And any change in services, a new um, purchase order would need to, you know, to come in because mm -hmm. in the system we would have to update that. So whoever is actually providing the services is getting paid for that. But I, I also want to say just because you know, I didn't see the full question, but just in hearing how you read it, Deb, I, I just want to um, also let people know that, 
you know, if their day program opens, but they still feel comfortable getting, you know, kind of that, those holistic supports with their SLA provider at this point in time, they don't have to change. Um, you know, that, that truly is somebody's choice. But if they want to, then yes, they are able to, to do that. And there does need to be some, you know, a, a PO sent in so we can update it in the system. Does the start date for enhanced funding go back to August? That's, that's yes. the August 1st. Okay. For the first round, so if you haven't applied now, no. But for the people who have already applied, yes, the initial round. Otherwise, it will be going forward. Can you clarify if an S-109 needs to be submitted for day enhancement for SLA or just the updated purchase order? An S-109. Not a purchase order. You don't need a purchase order, just an S-109. If, if someone attended a program such as Cornerstone, which is a non-DDO agency, can day funds be accessible for the SLA contractor for day enhancement as they are now providing day support? Yes. Are there specific criteria for the SLA providing day supports required to qualify for the enhanced funding? Yes, and that is the agency that you're working with um, has that information and can provide it to the SLA provider. If I requested the S-109 funding back in August and was providing day services since March 18th, any reason why I would not be afforded the enhanced funding back through August? Did they apply already? If it says if I requested the S-109 funding. So it sounds like they did apply. So yes, we just, again, are working on how that is being paid out within the system. I would I recommend that they contact their, their agency, agency yeah. if it's not a general question, because yeah. the answer is going to be specific to that person rather than um, to the whole group. So, but what I will tell you is, um, we're not going to continue to go back to August. It's going to be a going forward. Um, so, so we're not going to accept applications in December and go back to August. Mm -hmm. So it's for the application. From when you apply. The ones that were already submitted. Yes. Yeah. There were many that have already been submitted. Can you repeat information about receiving the day enhancement and time frame for requesting as of August? Can I just say, I think that some, so, and, and jump in Kevin afterwards if you feel differently, but I think that if there's people who are interested in it, they really should contact their SL mm -hmm. um, provider and, and they can give them full um, details on mm -hmm. what they would need to do to work with, with that SLA provider agency. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing about public transportation barriers to employment for people with disabilities? Are others denied taking transportation to work for COVID fears? Well, I would just say, and I'm just jumping in because I know, um, you know, there was a group meeting earlier um, over the summer to talk about the transportation issues related to COVID. So I wouldn't say anybody's been denied transportation. I mean, I think that there are individuals who are choosing not to take, you know, the public transportation. I also know that RIPTA has their own uh, precautionary measures in place. It may be that they're not, um, you know, the they're taking less passengers um, because there needs to be, you know, certain space uh, on the bus, whether it's the regular uh, rip the public bus or, or the ride program as well, too. So there are precautionary measures that are put in place, but I don't um, know that anybody is being denied uh, access to transportation. Okay. Ride is not transporting unless person can guarantee other transportation unless person could guarantee other transportation should they get symptoms during should they get symptoms during the day right. i was just going to say i i have not heard that and we did meet with the ride um mm -hmm. the the people who who manage our program at RIPTA, and that's mm -hmm. not um anything that i have heard so if there are certain people who are denied Heather, uh, i'm sorry to interrupt but i think we need to look into that because i have heard yeah. Um, okay. That if, okay. if someone becomes symptomatic during the day, RIPTA won't provide the ride home. That yes, that okay. was a comment. It wasn't a question. It was a comment from Claire. Yeah. And she said that, um, so you have to be able to guarantee 
other transportation. But that's what I don't know. That's the yeah. thing I don't know, unless you know different, Ian. I have not heard Ride say you have to guarantee before you get on this bus that you would have an alternate means of, of getting home. That I haven't heard. I do. No, they haven't. They don't ask for the guarantee, but they make it clear if you're symptomatic, they won't pick you up. I'm sure that Ann said effectively makes, however they stated it, makes it accurate that um, if they take you one direction and you become symptomatic during the day, you have no way of getting you home. You have no way of getting home, so exactly. You need to have some, you need to be able to yeah, yeah, um, yeah. figure that out because you won't be able to get back through a ride if you um, sh develop symptoms during the day. Speaking of public transportation, another person is just sharing, Carrie Clark, just sharing that um, taking public transportation, it still remains difficult with COVID. The front seats are often not available to you. So the next question, uh, what outreach is there to homeschooled families which may have children with disabilities that are not met through public education path? Uh, for example, such as a student that is 22 and not yet serviced by transition program. And is that too late? Okay, I'll take that. Um, we know of students who are um, receiving schooling through the Department of Education and the local school district who invites us to the IEP meetings for students beginning at age 14 who have an intellectual disability or developmental disability. It looks like they may need um, adult services. So I would say if you're in need of some transition services, um, Actually, if, you're, if your family member is 22, they have probably already exited school funded services. So they would need to apply for services through the Division of Developmental Disabilities. But anyone else who is uh, homeschooling their children, if, you're, um, if your family member is under 22, then please definitely communicate with the, with the uh, town in which you live, the school district, in order to um, make sure that we are aware of those students. You can also certainly email me um, or call me um, and I will put my, it looks like I can probably put my email address in the chat here. Is there a process in place for acquiring PPEs for just direct support staff that work for self-directed individuals? So, so for the self-directed individuals, the process that we still currently have in place ha has not changed. It's, you know, individuals have been reaching out to their social caseworker um, at this point if they need something and, and their social caseworker has been making the, um, you know, just this, the connection so that that individual is able to, to get PPE. We were trying to work through the agencies to do that, but we still haven't gotten um, a finalized process to, to make that happen. Part of it just because the agencies are, are overwhelmed, the, you know, themselves right now too with finding staff to do just the basic support. So right now it's still the same as reaching out to your social case number. With vaccines on the horizon, are plans underway to roll those out to people with developmental disabilities? And, and where would people uh, with developmental disabilities fit in priorities for vaccination? So I'll answer that. So at this point, so obviously that's something that we'll have to be working with our partners at the Department of Health on, but I am not aware of any um, process in place yet, but that will certainly be a high priority as vaccines become available. As we talk about vaccines, there is a, a process in place that's being worked on and we'll get more information out on this for uh, surveillance testing to be occurring in the residential facilities. And our Dr. Daly here, who's the medical director at the department, um, will be the prescribing uh, physician so that the providers um, will be able to get the orders for doing surveillance testing um, in, in the facilities. And so um, Tina Spears has really taken the lead on getting this organized. She's done a great job on it, uh, working with the Department of Health on getting that organized so that they can be done um, at programs and we can get more testing done. So she's done a wonderful job. And, um, and so we're cooperating and working with them to get that in place. When you talk about numbers of people impacted by COVID in group homes, are you including those quarantining because of a possible exposure? No, I, the numbers that I gave were specifically about COVID positive individuals, not people quarantining. So thank you, that's a great clarification. That I missed the number of positive individuals in group homes. Could you say it again? Yes. So 
In the last 14 days, um, there are 33 residents who are currently impacted or have been in the last 14 days. If people want to know, since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been 143 um, individuals who have been impacted by COVID since the pandemic began. Just a comment, there's that many individuals, but the number of direct support staff is a lot higher than that, right? There's- Yeah, so the, in the last 14 days, 63 um, staff have been um, COVID positive. Staff need a big, big uh, hero's yeah. board. We didn't, yeah. I don't think we tracked staff in from the beginning, so I don't think we could tell you how many overall. Was the agenda item on coordination of Medicaid applications missed? No, I didn't even realize it was in the agenda. So yes, I guess I did miss it. But um, so yeah, so Tracy Levesque, who is not on the call today, is working um, with Department of Human Services, and I'm going to speculate OHHS um, on this, this issue. So she's not here today to report out on it, but there is continued effort um, to, and that's actually also there's some work in the work groups on combining and working to reduce the burden on people in terms of how they apply for um, services and being able to get a system in place where information can be shared across agencies so people are, having, are not having to um, repeatedly provide the same information across the systems. So we'll get more information out on that um, as this process develops over time. Uh, one question that was asked and answered was just what does START stand for? And the answer is Systemic Therapeutic Assessment Resources and Treatment. There's a mouthful. That's why they call it START. Um, <laughs> I would not have been able to answer yeah, that. I know. <laughs> um, thank you for Claire. Claire did that. Somebody wants to know what SLA stands for, Shared Living Arrangement. Shared Living Arrangement, yeah. Should gym membership be promoted at this time when the governor may call another lockdown starting next week? I saw that come through. Um, excellent point. So I was reading that off as a list, but I didn't intend it to be an encouragement to get to the gym during the pandemic at all. So thank you for pointing that out. Would it be fiscally more beneficial gaining technology as opposed to a gym membership? Isn't that kind of like person-centered is like what the person- Person-centered, yeah. yeah. So so each individual has to decide which is, which service is beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. I think us, it's probably the same person who mentioned the um, timing on gym memberships. Mm -hmm. So of course, during the pandemic, we'd want to consider the timing, but but each individual has to decide mm -hmm. um, with the support of, of their their agency or their plan writer or whoever what's in their best interest or their mm -hmm. family input, whoever. But that's not a question we can answer mm -hmm. across every individual, which what's fiscally better. So, yeah, if you did, then there'd be no person centered, right? That wouldn't be person centered. That's right. Will the joint meeting, um, the one for the work groups, will that be open to advocates to listen to? No. What we're going to do on that so that it is public is um, we're working to get the minute, the meeting minutes um, put on our website so people can read them. How can we highlight or make easier access to Sherlock plan Medicaid buy-in as a viable option for folks who are working? I think all the efforts that are going on right now with um, you know, Medicaid and their long-term support services, we are trying to get um, more information out through the no wrong door. You know, we're working with outside vendors so that um, you know, the OHHS website, DH website, our website has clear information the different programs you know that are available to people out there so I think that we are I feel like in our in, in just for DD specifically I think when people are working um, you know Jay Tracy um, Ann as well you know through the benefits counseling we really try to get that information to people so I would suggest that people are going through benefits counseling as well too if they're working because all of that stuff will be explained to them um, you know, when, when they are meeting with a benefits counselor or even getting any information on benefits counseling. I don't know if um, if Jay or Ann has anything else to add to that, but that's, that's you know, the way that they're going to get the most comprehensive information too about their um, 
you know, eligibility and it affecting, you know, their working affecting their el eligibility. Um, well, allowing family members to get paid, um, have, continue past COVID. Can you still pay family members after COVID? We don't know the answer to that yet. That it is our goal to get that approved, and we're working with Medicaid, uh, and we'll be working with Medicaid to extend that beyond the pandemic. Let me just follow up on what I was saying. So the the reason, just if people want to know why would you extend it, uh, the philosophy behind that is, in terms of making individual choices, it allows the individual to choose whomever they want to provide their service. So that that's why we would want to extend it after the pandemic. Has the waiver for family members who live with self-directed support clients to get paid for direct service work been extended beyond February 2021? It's for the duration of the pandemic, I believe. Yeah. yeah. For the state of emergency, yeah. Is there a general sense of how many agencies are providing day services in these COVID days? Are the state caseworkers or ORS still involved in any furloughs or cutbacks? I guess that's two questions. Um, I don't have that number in front of me right now, but we do know that answer. Um, so we could certainly get that out uh, when we post information, so. ORS does not have furloughs, but we are still, cl quote, closed lobby and limiting community-based work during COVID. That's just from Joe Mo Murphy. Who can I contact when caseworker does not respond? I would contact their super the casework supervisor. Also, in doing that, some people are reluctant to contact the supervisor because they don't want to create a tension with their worker. It won't create tension. It's not a problem. It's not getting them in trouble. Everyone knows how busy everybody is. And so if you're not able to reach your worker, it's fine to contact the supervisor and they're not in trouble for it. It's not meaning that they're not responsive, but, um, and I'd also remember that um, the pandemic is affecting a lot of people, so it may be we don't know why they're not getting back to you, so please contact the supervisor if you're not hearing from them. How do they contact the supervisor? By calling them. But is it is that just should they know that information? Um, I think so. Is that right, Heather? That that yeah, I, I think some people should, but people some people might not. You don't know. Call the main number, and we'll find it out for you. Or or even just to make it easy on you, the way that we'll instruct is that if you call and ask. We'll get the message to the supervisor for you and have the supervisor call you back um, so that you're not having to make an additional phone call. Any hope for respite for people? Uh, you know, can people use respite as a to get some relief? People are stressed out. Want me to read the whole question? So I, I can answer that. So respite still exists. Um, we haven't canceled respite or terminated respite. Uh, I can probably say that it's more difficult to access respite uh, given who's able to provide respite, hmm. but it's not a service that's been terminated. The people who don't weren't using it before, can they access that? Um, it needs to be part of your plan. So I'll let Heather speak to it specifically in terms of um, allocation for respite, but um, I'm, I'm not aware of if everybody gets it or not gets it, but. Yes. But it would have to be, there'd have to be an allocation for it. Yes, there would have to be an allocation for it and not everybody does get respite, but I mean, if people had it and they want to use it, whether, you know, in an SLA, then yes, they can still use. So in the shared living arrangements, people, you know, get respite services. They can still use those and, and people still have been utilizing their respite services. So for example, if somebody was, were isn't able to get their the supports that they usually got like other day supports could they use more of their more respite to meet that if they had some yes, they could move respite? money from their day program funding right. into their respite line item yes and get increased uh respite supports if that's what they need and they have somebody who's willing to provide those supports for them yes absolutely and we have had people do that has there been any discussion as to provide funding to train individuals on using technology? So there is a code, yes, that we did identify for training for um, technology. 
how could I use my, extend my plan to pay for technology? Could you make information about that available? We can. can yeah. you as far as the technology, it'll, you can use, you can purchase technology. Is there a way to purchase um, internet access? We're still working on finding out that specifically more and more states we're seeing are able to do it through CMS. So we just need to figure out the ways to um, make that happen. Is that, is it a matter of, because it's a, a monthly payment, like if it was a one-time payment, would that change it? Like if you could pay for that. So from what I've seen in the research that I've done, and I'm not going to say, I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but from what I've seen, the, one of the main issues with it is who's accessing. So if you have it, it needs to be for that individual. So we know mm -hmm. that people can have devices, their own devices, where they have internet access that just that device. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're looking into. Oh, so I have an example. Uh, there's um, Wi-Fi hotspots that you can purchase that you come with a plan, but it's like a person gets that and has it, a, you know, they use it for their device. So is that, that's, you probably don't know exactly, but like that might be something. I, uh, yeah, I do yeah. know about, about the hotspots too. Okay. Yes, that would, that would be something. So we just have to work through that and make sure with, with Medicaid and, you know, that it's in our waiver and it's not something right, that- Right, so it's not paying for your whole house to get cable, but, you know, you can- Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Um. <laughs> and that it's written into our waiver so that we can pay for it uh, as well, too. That's the other part of it. Mary Beth wanted to make sure that people knew that if individuals apply for free phone through the process explained in the weekly Buddha updates, there is, a, there is access to internet on the phone. Does smart home technology fits into that package too? Like things to help you turn on the lights so you don't need a staff person to come and flick them on and off and that kind of stuff? Yes, it does. If that's something that somebody needs, we have had some people who have asked for that, not a lot, but we have had some, you know, and people have bought certain things for their home to help keep them uh, in, you know, and in, in remain independent within their own home. You said there's technology funding available. Is that funding above or outside the normal tier package? It is within their tier package, yes. It comes yeah. out of their, their plan. So that's the other piece of it too. You know, they can purchase this technology, but yes, it is going to draw down mm -hmm. on their um, service dollars. But it would help you in other ways for those, you know. Yes, like, exactly. Service that, um, so that's the balance, yes. It's hopeful that that will provide you with, you know, some, some different additional support. So maybe it can help you to become more independent. Is there a limit on how much money can be spent on assistive technology? People have had conflicting answers. If there is a limit, could you state it? So there's not a limit, but it depends, of course, on what people are buying. So like I think Kevin said before, it's very individualized, and it is. It, it depends what the person needs, what they're utilizing it for. It needs to obviously be attached to their, their goals uh, that are in their plan and, and, you know, be giving them either greater access to the community or assisting them mm -hmm. with employment or, or building some, you know, skills. Mm -hmm. Again, it's individualized. I can't say, oh, you know, there's like a $5,000 limit because we haven't put that on it. It depends what somebody needs. Does a technology committee exist to evaluate new technologies for being, pro being proposed or used in other states to help those in our community today? So no, a committee doesn't exist, but we, I, I forgot about that question. That's a great question. So we uh, thought that once we get through the work group, um, court work groups, we would form a committee, I think. So one doesn't exist, but we think it would be a great idea to have a committee and um, we will form a committee in the new year. And you can buy technology. Could you use your funding to also buy like a class on how to, you know, pay for a lesson on how to use the technology or some tech, you know, they have those geek squad support things or something. Because a lot of times in technology part is a little intimidating. You're like, well, I've got this computer, but what do I do with it? So is that another option for? Yes, it is. There is there is a um, a way to fund training. It's something we were looking into because you know we 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 need to have codes for certain things that we're funding. Yes, it would go under goods and services still within within somebody's plan, just like the uh, technology would. But yes, they can request that. Yep. Yeah. Somebody just one more. Somebody said a comment that technology needs to go under T five nine nine nine, not goods and services. Uh, 
fifty nine ninety nine is the code for goods and services. So that's the same thing. What are people doing about trainings for SLA and respite workers and direct support staff, i.e. CPR, first aid, et cetera, given COVID? I think that's a question that they would have to ask their agencies. Kevin, I don't know, do you want to jump in? But. A little bit. So um, agencies are working to provide as much training as they can, but they're also working with our regulatory office to waive trainings that can be waived that aren't safety related. Um, so, um, so it really kind of depends on what the training is, but they are all trying to keep up as best they can with what training can be done. Um, some things are being done online so that, um, so obviously during COVID, you're probably not gonna be practicing with a whole bunch of people in the room on what normal CPR training would be looking like. But most of the agencies, if not all of them are doing some kind of training in a virtual method to, to um, keep people up to date um, on the required trainings, but they're also working to get some things waived so that um, their primary focus, and this is really critical for providers, is uh, focusing on providing services to um, the people in their facilities. That's, that's what they're really focusing on now. That's critical. And right now, particularly in the last few weeks where um, COVID has really uh, surged, we want to make sure that we're not putting additional burdens on them um, that can be waived. We're wanting to make sure that we're allowing them the ability to focus on um, meeting staffing requirements and meeting service needs for individuals. I just wanted to mention quickly too, just because somebody um, had sent me this message to say that there is CPR, CPR online as well, because I know some people were asking about that. I guess they're offering some online CPR classes too. So if you know, people do want that. They could, could look into that as well, too. Are there CPR trainings available for self-direct support staff payment through purchase order? Yes, there are. So if people want to um, send their staff to a training, they can um, have it paid for uh, through their goods and services line item. Can you explain EVV again and the, what it stands for? Electronic Visit Verification um, System. So for individuals who are getting um, self-directed supports and need total hands-on care for some of those supports like individuals' ADLs, um, they would need to, to uh, do this electronic visit verification where the staff has to check in at the start of their assistance with that individual doing those ADLs and then they check out when, when they stop doing that. Because as we know, you know, people who are self-directing getting a variety of supports and EVV is only for in-home services, not anything that's done out in the community with the individual and even within their home, any task that the individual, you know, is doing on their own or um, is learning how to do so that they will not always need total care with, with doing those tasks, it's not subject to EVV. And again, there's such a small number of individuals, again, like I mentioned earlier, so far there's 37 individuals in the self-directed system who are going to need to comply with this. So it's so small. So if you are one of those individuals, there will be targeted efforts to, to reach out to you and, and the um, FIs are already doing that with those individuals. Are there funding areas in place to assist FIs with the implementation of EVV? Yes, so, so I wouldn't say funding areas, but one of the questions that has come up, yes, is the training, training individuals, um, you know, because the, the individual, the family is going to need to train their employees. So on how to use this system and what it is about. And so, yes, we have looked into um, ways to provide funding to agencies or the FIs who are going to have to do that. Can I ask a question just uh, clarifying on the EVV for people? Is this only for home-based services that were originally home-based and not COVID didn't change that? People are at home, right? No, because it's only for individuals who need total hands-on assistance. So no, COVID has not, has not changed anything. 
it's not, um, you know, we understand that certain things might change or things might happen um, with individuals uh, throughout their life, but it, it's, it's basically around individuals who will always need assistance with um, some of their ADLs. I think that might be all the questions so far. Can you, if somebody didn't get a chance to answer, didn't hear their question answered, could you type it again or something? I just want to remind people I need to get off the call at 420. So it's Heather, you party. Go to a big party. You're going to a big party, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> so again, this information, you're going to be able to see the webinar, the, the, the recorded webinar, and you'll be and the transcript of the questions with the answers. And if you guys have other things you said you could find out more about, you'll put that in there so that people will be able to look at this. If they couldn't attend or you missed some part of it, you'll be able to see that. I know when we've done it, we've put it on YouTube so people can watch the cat can have captions of it and you can also translate it. You can, you know, re see the, the captions in, in uh, different languages. I wanted to, to, before I get off the call, just um, first of all, thank Deb and Kelly for hosting the call. Deb, great job leading hey, with the Keith, questions. Wait, for Keith. You can't see Keith, but he's over there in Facebook. Oh, yeah, Keith. Oh, Keith, yeah, for <laughs> doing the you. Facebook. And I know Michelle uh, did a lot of work to get this uh, prepared. I want to thank the state team for um, providing answers to questions and helping prep for the meeting. And um, also for everybody in the community who took part in the call and asking great questions. Your questions help inform other people who may not have thought of the questions or, or who had the questions and, and uh, needed to know the answers. So I just really appreciate everybody for your involvement in today's meeting. It was very supportive to everybody. That's it then. You're not going to miss a thing, Kevin. Go to your party. There you go. All right. <laughs> Will do. Yeah, thanks so much. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Right,